Welcome to Game of Thrones Abridged with Alt Swift X. This is a show where we read and discuss the A Song of Ice and Fire series chapter by chapter. And who doggy dog have we got a show today? Because we're talking about Tyrion Lannister. T. T. Slizzle himself. Uh, Hand of the King. Son of Tywin. Uh, as he's politicking and 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 doing his thing in King's Landing, and uh, this is on. This is honestly just going to be one great big like Tyrion roast. Because one of the things about Tyrion is that he's he's a beloved character. He's one of the most charismatic and loved uh, performances by by Peter Dinklage in the Game of Thrones TV show. That's what people think about when they think of Tyrion. They imagine the handsome, charming Peter Dinklage. Tyrion in the books is not like that. Tyrion in the books is ugly, for one thing, and also a dick. He's selfish and and occasionally murderous, and I I think is nowhere near as as virtuous and heroic as Tyrion is in the TV show, especially later on when we start getting into the the later books, like Book Five. Tyrion is truly a villain. In a very old interview, uh, a somewhat questionable interview, uh, George Martin described Tyrion as the villain. Um, and it's sort of a weird thing to say. Normally, George Martin describes Tyrion as, as a morally grey character. Um, but he did this interview, it was in like the year 2000, no, 19... 2000? near the turn of the millennium and 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 he described Tyrion as a villain which i think makes the most sense in the context of this book a clash of kings which is what came out around that time cuz in this book Tyrion is helping the lannisters he is helping king joffrey like K- grand puba joffleberry emperor himself is is the tyrant on the throne and Tyrion is helping him and Queen Cersei and and the war criminal Tywin Lannister are th- that is the side that Tyrion is on. While the more heroic, you know, Davos Seaworth is working with Stannis, who wants to, who is the rightful king, and who eventually decides to save the world from the White Walkers. Like like that is who Tyrion's fighting against. And then Arya is trying to survive in the in the inferno that that Tyrion's father is is burning across the riverlands and all these the torture and the rape and the horrors that Arya sees there that is the side that Tyrion is fighting for um and, and Rob Stark and Catelyn trying to win some some independence and freedom for, from the north after the death of Ned it's all they are the most sympathetic characters and Tyrion is against them. So like Tyrion even in the book in the books he's a very sympathetic character, very likable character. And and I think that that's this wonderful trick that George Martin is pulling basically because we 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 we, we sympathize with Tyrion from the start because he's the underdog or at least Tyrion feels that he's the underdog. And, and and by convincing us by casting this spell of making us love this this witty underdog Tyrion it, it's like the pot in it's like the frog in the boiling water where we don't even realize as as Tyrion gradually becomes more and more sort of brutal and evil but he takes us along his emotional journey every step of the way so we don't even realize that by the time book five comes around and Tyrion is a gosh darn villain a, a, a goddamn mustache twirling vengeance plotting top hat wearing monster we don't even realize how villainous he's become because george has taken us along that journey um Tyrion is is almost as villainous as cersei um the difference is that we weren't with cersei from her point of view from the very beginning and so we don't sympathize with her as much Tyrion has more pov chapters than any other character in the series uh, Tyrion is George R. R. Martin's favorite character, um, and I think that the the psychological and emotional depth of Tyrion's character speaks to how much George relates to him. I, I think there's definitely a lot of George in Tyrion. Um, it was interesting. Something that uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, the authors of The Expanse, who are friends of George R. R. Martin said is that George Martin has repeatedly written characters who are dwarfs. Um, and I think the reason for that is, you know, George Martin doesn't know what it's like to be a dwarf, but I think that the 
emotions that he's that he's drawing from and writing about when he's writing about dwarfs is the feeling of being inadequate and the feeling of being rejected and the feeling of being mocked and the feeling of being ugly um and i think that's something that george martin is you know without speculating too much that's something that george martin is very emotionally invested in those those feelings and that's and that is so very much what's going on with with Tyrion's arc and the ways that those feelings lead to atrocity is i think what his arc is about anyway we're going to get into it uh thanks so much for the super chats from father paprika who says i was missing akok in my life keep it up uh chris says can't stay got to work but thanks for the new chapter thanks guys thanks also for the donos earlier from uh dr guy and dania let's get into it so first line of uh Tyrion 8 but no Tyrion 7 I'm still bad at Roman numerals after all these years you'd think I would have figured out Roman numerals but they're tricky there's the V's there's the I's there's the X's uh I I, I can't handle it I I want I read, I heard about this study with elephants where elephants can, are quite good at counting the number of apples in a bucket. And elephants are actually better at counting apples than humans are. Like they can tell which bucket has the most apples in it and therefore which bucket they want. Because you better believe that those elephants want the, the, the bucket with the highest apple content. Uh, and often they beat humans at, at that counting. Anyway, the first line is, the rushes were scratchy under the soles of his bare feet. Which immediately raises some rushes questions. R- rushes are a, a vegetable material, a plant material that was used for flooring in medieval times. Um, but from my half assed Googling, there seems to be like a certain amount of ambiguity and uncertainty about like how these rushes were used at various times like were these rushes just sort of loosely scattered on the floor or were these rushes like woven into mats and things like i don't really like i I find it hard to visualize why you would want to cover your floor in rushes um because like like i can understand if if you're like a peasant and you've got like a dirt floor in like your little shitty hovel i can understand rushes being preferable to like dirt um but like if you're living in a castle like Tyrion, he's in the tower of the hand wouldn't a stone floor be adequate like a castle stone floor like a stone floor would be really easy to like sweep and mop and whatever why use rushes at all i I suppose a, a stone a bare stone floor would be very uh cold to your little your little bare feet uh, you might need some castle socks. Never never walk the castle floors without your castle socks, I say. Um, don't really see the appeal of rushes. R- rushes are sweet-smelling sometimes, apparently. I mean, they're described as such in A Song of Ice and Fire sometimes. And they're meant to, like, cover the smells of medieval life. I don't suppose the ventilation is great in a castle. Um... But that's but like it, it, there's rushes, uh, and Tyrion is is awake uh, late at night, and he speaks to Podrick Payne, who is announcing there is a visitor at Tyrion's door late at night, and Podrick Payne is sleep befuddled, um, and it, and it doesn't take much to befuddle Podrick Payne. Podrick Payne is in an in a near constant state of befuddlement. He he is a befuddlement master. He's he's full of befuddlery. He's he's a befuddler. He's a born befuddler. He mu- he muddles through his befuddlement. If you can be befuddled, can you be fuddled? Can you be unfuddled? Can you be de-befuddled? Undebefuddled? Some uh, we need an etymology corner about the word befuddled. But Podrick announces that there's a visitor, and Tyrion says, "Okay, see him to my solar." And I got solar questions as well. Like, why is it called the solar? The solar seems to be like the audience chamber it's like the room where you hang out with folks uh it's like your living room the solar i I, i'm guessing that maybe that's where where daylight and and sunlight comes in like maybe there's like windows and stuff in in the solar uh but at nighttime i suppose you'd call it a lunar because because the moonlight is what would be coming in to your solar maybe you call it a lunar at nighttime and and a solar at daytime there's a lot of uh castle uh, architecture terms going on here um but 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 it's late at night it's well past midnight uh and Tyrion has been working he's been working well into the morning reading by the flickering light of a candle which must be murder on your eyes like imagine trying to read 
handwritten notes in 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 candlelight. Your eyes would go to your eye, it'd be so bad for your eyes. Um, and it, and it describes Tyrion. You know, he he's been reading reports of Varys's whisperers and poring over Littlefinger's books of accounts. He's been reading all night, and and it just strikes me that being hand of the king is so not what Tyrion should be doing. Uh, Tyrion should be a maester. Tyrion should be a maester at the Citadel because he loves books and he loves like reading through history and and dragon lore and he's and he's smart. Uh, T- Tyrion would be so well off as a maester. That would that would suit him so much better um, than than being a hand of the king or a politician. Um, I I would imagine that for similar reasons why like uh, Randall Tarly didn't want Sam Tarly to be a maester. I imagine Tywin might not want Tyrion to be a maester for similar reasons. Like it's seen as like unmanly uh, to be a maester. Uh, but, you know, Tywin... I mean, it would make sense for Tywin to want Tyrion to be a maester so that Tyrion would give up his claim on Castle Rock. Uh, because Tyrion, uh, after after Jaime um, becomes a Kingsguard, he gives up his claim to Castle Rock, and therefore Tyrion becomes Tywin's heir. And yet Tyr- Tywin makes it extremely clear that he does not want Tyrion to be his heir. He does not want him to inherit Castle Rock. So it would make sense for Tywin to want Tyrion to be a maester. But, you know, that doesn't happen for, for plot reasons, I suppose. But I almost I almost want, as an ending for Tyrion, for him to just be a maester. Uh, like an archmaester. He'd, he'd do a great job of it. Like, I imagine that maybe after, like, Euron and his, like, Kraken Cthulhu army, like, after they roll on in and, like, destroy Old Town, uh, maybe Tyrion could come in and, like, help rebuild the Citadel. Um... That, that, that there is speculation that Euron will attack Old Town and and might destroy the library of uh, the the Citadel in a similar way that the Library of Alexandria was destroyed, um, b- b- because that could sort of connect to like one one of the weird things they did in Game of Thrones season eight was that they 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 didn't really reveal anything useful about the White Walkers or anything particularly revelatory about you know what the white walkers want what what is their culture what how do they work what's their deal but 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 they did say that the white walkers and the night king represent forgetting and like the death of memory because that's real death real death is not when you die real death is when the last person who remembers you dies which is a lovely concept well, one of my favorite things ever maybe uh is jk rowling author of harry potter talked about how like uh the the harry potter books are her horcruxes in harry potter there's this concept called a horcrux where you 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 split off part of your soul and you put your soul part of your soul into an object so that when you die you actually don't die. You stay immortal because part of your soul survives in that object. And the way to achieve immortality is to put parts of your soul's soul in in objects so that you live on. And and she uh, and it has been said by her or by someone that the Harry Potter books are J.K. Rowling's Horcruxes. J.K. Rowling put part of her soul in each of the books that she wrote, and so she will live on after she dies she she will have a legacy and she will have immortality through her work which i think is really beautiful and poetic um and uh, that's tangentially related to to this idea of the white walkers and death are about forgetting uh in game of thrones season eight and one i I don't remember who said this I, i read someone said this online but someone said that like like you know for that reason, for like, you know, White Walkers, Death, Apocalypse representing forgetting, the destruction of the Citadel in Old Town would be an incredibly potent symbol of death and forgetting and apocalypse because that's where all the books are. Like, books are rare in A Song of Ice and Fire. Knowledge is, is, is difficult to, to nail down. Uh, well, easy to nail down when, it, when it's in a book if you've got nails that are, lo- that are long enough. Uh, but the point is that the destruction of the Citadel would be a horrific loss of knowledge and a loss of memory because of, all of the destruction of the books. So I think, like, after that happens, after the burning of the Library of Alexandria, it'd be cool if Tyrion retired to be a maester and 
helped rebuild and helped gather together the remaining books and helped record the history of the War of the Five Kings. I suppose that's sort of what Sam does in in the end of the TV show when he writes the uh, Song of Ice and Fire thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what Tyrion's fate will be in the end, but I like to think that being a maester would be nice. Anyway, so Tyrion was working all night uh, and Lancel Lannister is the visitor who has arrived in the night um, and Tyrion thinks that uh, Cersei must have sent Lancel late at night in the hopes of finding Tyrion asleep and befuddled and not sharp so that he can be taken advantage of, I suppose. Um, in, in, the, in the TV show, they did this a bit differently. Um, like, in the book, Cersei is trying to get an advantage over Tyrion by sending Lancel at night. But in the TV show... Uh, Tyrion gets an advantage over Lancel by him coming at night because by the fact that Lancel comes at night, Tyrion deduces that Lancel must be spending time with Cersei at night and therefore he sort of figures out or it's sort of confirmed to him that Lancel is having sex with Cersei. In the books, it's different. Um, minor difference. But anyway, so Tyrion goes and has a... He, he, he takes a dump. He squats in the garter robe which is another funny little medieval room term. Apparently, garderobe uh, was, was like a French term for like a wardrobe, which can be like a storage space for your valuable items. Uh, but garderobe can also mean a, a privy, like a, like a toilet, um, which is a confusing double meaning. Like, the word can mean toilet, but the word can always mean also means storage space for your valuables. The implication being, if we combine those two meanings, uh, the, the implication being that, that a toilet is a place to store your valuables, which means that your poop is precious, which, in the context of the Lannisters, makes perfect sense, because it is rumoured that Tywin Lannister shits gold. Therefore, when Tywin shits in the garderobe, he is not only defecating, he is storing his valuables. He's treasured, he's, he's, he's treasured poop is what he's storing. So I think George is making an extremely elaborate garderobe pun. No, no, he's probably not. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, you ever hear the phrase turd burgling? To, to, to burgle one's turds? Okay, moving on. So Tyrion takes a dump and uh, he decides to let Lancel wait uh, instead of uh, talking to him immediately because he figures the longer he makes Lancel wait, the more anxious he will become. Uh, and Tyrion likes nothing more than making others uncomfortable um, and throwing them off so that he can run circles around them and outwit them. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I think it's sort of self-destructive. Like, like, Tyrion is, like, antagonistic to everyone by default. Like, he, he, he never is, like, sincere and open and warm to anyone by default. He is always defensive, sardonic, aggressive in, like, a passive-aggressive sort of a way. And that's, like, his imp persona, right? Like, that's his whole thing, is that since he's been bullied and humiliated and disrespected all his life, his way of defending himself is by being sarcastic, defensive, antagonistic all the time. Um, but I don't think that's a very good strategy, because I think that throughout this book and throughout the story, his defensive, antagonistic, passive-aggressive, sarcastic persona actually just alienates the people around him and makes a lot of enemies. And indeed, in the next book, when Tyrion gets falsely accused of murdering Joffrey, all those people who he was a sarcastic, antagonistic dickhead to, they all come back to haunt him and they condemn him to death. So, I, I, you know, when Tyrion tells Jon in his first chapter that, hey, you should wear your identity like armor, when people, when people give you a name, you should, you should own it and you should be the imp and you should be this sharp-tongued dude, I don't think that's good advice. I don't think it's good advice. I, I think Tyrion destroys himself by playing the persona that he does. And then Tyrion plays with his hair. He, he describes his hair as thin and flaxen. And that, that is a whole thing. We could do a whole podcast episode just on Tyrion's hair color. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, actually. Because, like, because on the Song of Ice and Fire wiki um, on Westeros.org, which is the most used 
wiki, which is seen as like a definitive resource of information about A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, on the wiki, up until very recently, the wiki article for Tyrion said that Tyrion, uh, you know, he, he's a dwarf, he has eyes of two different colours, uh, and his hair is a mixture of blonde and black. That's what it said until recently. And and the interesting thing is that the books don't support that, really. If If you look at how Tyrion's hair is actually described in the books... The first time we see Tyrion, his hair is described as pale blonde. Let me get the actual wording. It is a... It is a lank fall of hair so blonde it seemed white. Which, which, which I'll admit is slightly ambiguous. Like, like his eyes appearing out from under a lank fall of hair so blonde it seems white. Which means that, well, maybe not all of his hair is blonde. Maybe just that lank fall of hair is blonde. Um, but but then, like, all doubt is removed when later Jamie in book one, describes Tyrion as fair-haired. And, and then now, t- in book two, Tyrion describes his hair as thin and flaxen. And flaxen, of course, means blonde-ish, because, because flax is sort of blonde-ish. The point is that Tyrion is blonde, but in the fifth book, A Dance with Dragons... There, there is one little line that, that where Tyrion is, is enslaved and he's having a bad time outside Marine, and it says, Strands of hair, pale blonde and black, clung to his brow. So that does mean that there are some black hairs on Tyrion's head. That, that's what that means. Um, and some enterprising wiki editor has taken that line and gone, okay, therefore Tyrion has black and blonde hair, so let's make the article say that he has a mixture of black and blonde hair. But that's not a fair interpretation. 90% of the times when Tyrion's hair is described, or well, 75% at least, it's described as blonde. There's just this one little anomaly where it's described as having some black in there as well. And fine, like maybe he has some little black hairs. Maybe maybe he has highlights, Amy Bennett says in the live chat. Maybe. Um, but, you know, like people can have like, um, you know, the, the roots or like the, the sideburns. I mean, Tyrion does have a blonde and black beard. Like his, his beard is described as being blonde and black. So there is some black hair in the mix there. But most of the time his hair is described as blonde. So I think it's a gross misrepresentation, a very a very slight misrepresentation really, to say that Tyrion has a mix of blonde and black hair. But the reason why that's interesting is that many fan artists, like you can go, especially on Tumblr, uh, there's lots of people drawing pictures of Song of Ice and Fire characters, and Tyrion often, by many artists, is drawn as having a mixture of blonde and black hair. Like There's like these thick, distinct streaks of black hair. Like you can go and Google it. Some of these artists... Uh, have have this have this thing where where they depict Tyrion as having th- th- these like streaks and swirls of black hair in his blonde hair, which I don't think is what George Martin is going for at all. But just because some editor on the Wiki of Ice and Fire decided to describe him as being blonde and black haired, that's what's happened. And I think it's an example of misinformation getting out there. If I was the king of the world, I would suggest that the citations on the Wiki of Ice and Fire, and indeed the citations in anything, um, should have uh, a, a, an excerpt of text in the citation so that you can find the specific spot in the chapter that, that says what you're talking about. Because currently on the Wiki of Ice and Fire, when you have a citation, it just says, oh, Tyrion has blonde and black hair, citation, here's the chapter. But that means that if you want to find the, the, the point in the chapter that says the thing, you have to read the entire chapter, and these chapters are long sometimes, so it's very inconvenient. Way better if every citation has like a, a, just a couple of sentences of text, so that you can actually read the thing to see if it means what they say it means. And you can control F, and you can find the point in the chapter yourself. And I think the same ideally should be true on Wikipedia and in academic articles and every everywhere where citations are used. There should be a snippet of text so that if nothing else, you can control F and you can find the spot in the place that has the thing. We're going to move on from like hair gate, but but I think it's just it's just a little interesting like micro example of the way that misinformation especially on wikis, can very dramatically warp people's perception of of things. Like, there's this phenomenon on Wikipedia, 
this really big problem on Wikipedia, where sometimes someone will write something on Wikipedia and not include a citation. So this, like, they'll say that, you know, frogs uh, have seven legs. Uh, and it'll say that on Wikipedia. And then someone will come along and and realize, oh, well, well, that needs a citation. Um, like, someone's claiming that frogs have seven legs. We're not going to leave it up there unless it has a citation. So then someone will Google, oh, frogs, do they have seven legs? And there will be a whole bunch of websites all over the internet that say that frogs have seven legs. Uh, and, and the reason why those websites say that is because they got it off Wikipedia. E- even an unsighted, unsourced piece of bullshit on a wiki can rapidly spread and just become gospel truth all over the internet. And then what happens is that the Wikipedia article cites the websites as proof that frogs have seven legs. Uh, but they got it from Wikipedia, so it's circular. Like, Wikipedia cites the thing that, that is taking it from Wikipedia, it all goes around in a circle. So so we just invent these lies and these fabrications out of nowhere, and they self-reinforce, and then pretty quickly we live in a world where people believe that the world is flat and vaccines give you seven legs and, you know, all manner of other things. I, 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 it, it has been said, but I think we've got a bit of a problem with truth and facts, and I think that the part of the solution has to be a greater adherence to rigorous citation standards. <laughs> it's not sexy, and that's why no one does it. But that's what we need. Anyway, moving on. Thanks for the super chats. Thanks very much for the super chats from Quibble and Matthew Haig and Diego and Monotonous Pleb. Um, okay, so Flax in here, uh, and then Lancel arrives. All right, let's move on to page two. So Tyrion starts talking to Lancel, and uh, Tyrion immediately is all sarcastic. He says, oh, Lancel, your visits are too few. To what do I owe this undeserved pleasure? Such a, such a dick. I don't, I don't like Tyrion anymore. Um, he's always sarcastic. And, and Lancel comes along and he says that her grace, the Queen Regent Cersei Lannister, has sent me to command you to release Grand Maester Pycelle. Um, because Pycelle is, you know, he's, he's loyal to Cersei, so Cersei wants him back in power. Of course, Tyrion recently imprisoned Pycelle and humiliated him and cut off his beard when he found that Pycelle was not strictly loyal to him and no one else. Uh, so now Lancelot and Cersei are demanding him to be released. Um, a- and Tyrion recently poisoned Cersei. He poisoned his sister in a, in a mild way. Um, because he wanted to get her out of the way so that he could sort a few things out without her interference. Uh, but Cersei has recovered quite quickly after a, after a few days. Um, and Tyrion is not terribly surprised by Cersei's return to health. He had hoped that she'd stay sick for a few more days. Uh, but, you know, she is Jamie's twin after all, and so she has returned to health quite quickly. And that is interesting because there is this theory that that Cersei and Jamie might actually be the children of Aerys Targaryen, not Tywin Lannister, um, which I, I think is not true personally. Um, but that is a theory. And the thing about Targaryens is that there is a suggestion in the text that Targaryens are resistant to sickness and disease. Uh, Daenerys thinks that Targaryens are immune to disease because Viserys told her so, and indeed Daenerys does not get sick with the bloody flux, even though she like hangs out with people who are sick with it. Uh, And in the new Targaryen history book Fire and Blood, uh, it is said that Targaryens are believed to not get sick, although a Targaryen princess does die of sickness, so it's not true all of the time. But there is a belief and there is a tendency for Targaryens not to get sick, apparently. So you could argue that the fact that, Cer- the fact that Cersei recovers quickly from her poisoning uh, is uh, su- uh, potentially is supportive evidence behind Cersei and Jaime being Targaryens and the children of Ares, which is an interesting little detail, though probably not a significant one. All right, so chatting with Lancel, and they have a little bit of uh, wine, and Tyrion notes that, well, wine does have its dangers, and that's Tyrion's little subtle way of telling Lancel, hey, I know that you helped get King Robert killed by giving him that strong wine while he was hunting, which is part of why he got killed by that boar. 
Uh, so Tyrion's been all subtle, although he's being a little bit too subtle because Lancel doesn't realise that Tyrion is, is hinting about the Robert thing until later. Because Lancel served the wine that got Robert killed. Um, and Lancel is just being all sort of uppity and, and bold and domineering. And, uh, you know, he, he has a sneer across his face. He was enjoying this. He takes his lessons from Cersei. And so Lancel is, is trying to lord over... Tyrion, because, because Lancel is a newly made knight, he's just like 16 years old, he, he is having sex with Cersei, and Cersei is giving him these sorts of political favours, and he feels very up himself, as you probably would if you were sleeping with the Queen and had all these political powers and you were a fancy, fancy, blonde, handsome boy. Um, and of course, what goes on in this chapter is that Tyrion basically takes great pleasure in taking Lancel down a peg. Uh, I think there's an undercurrent of jealousy here, or envy, rather, in that, you know, Tyrion, Tyrion is envious of this tall, handsome boy who has advantages that Tyrion does not, chiefly being tall and handsome. And, and so I think Tyrion enjoys lording over Lancel, humiliating him, manipulating him, in a similar way that Tyrion did the same thing to Pycelle recently, and Janos Slint. Like, we think of Tyrion as this good guy, but Tyrion's a bully. Tyrion bullies and humiliates and belittles Lancel and Pycelle and Janos Slint and many others for no other reason than his own satisfaction and his own ego. And of course, like, you know, Tyr and Tyrion does it because he thinks of himself as an underdog, you know? But, like, he he's not fighting people his own size. Phrasing. Like, like who Tyrion should be going after is the actually dangerous people. Like, Littlefinger. Like... Varys, like the motherfucking Night King. Tyrion is not fighting the real enemies of the realm, or even the real enemies to himself. He's like picking the easy targets, like fucking Lancel. Tyrion's a bully. And, and you know, I, I suppose that's probably like a truism, that, you know, people who are bullies tend to be people who have been bullied themselves, you know? Like, people punch down because they have been punched and belittled themselves. Um... You know, people who have shitty parents or people who have shitty brothers or just people who get kicked around. Sometimes the way people react is to kick around people weaker than them, you know, which is just an unfortunate fact. But it doesn't justify anything that Tyrion does. So, yeah. And, and, and like, the fact that Lancel, you know, like, Tyrion thinks that Lancel is being, like, a domineering, arrogant prick... Because Cersei has taught him to be an arrogant, domineering prick. And of course, Cersei learned that from Tywin, you know? Like, C Cersei, when we're in her POV, she, all she wants to be is to be like Tywin. She want, That's why she is cruel, that's why she's proud, that's why she's power-hungry. She wants daddy's approval, and God knows that Tywin doesn't give out much approval. Tyrion thinks at one point that, that Tywin is open-handed with gold, but he is very miserly and niggardly with a, a love and affection. And and because Tywin is so goddamn tight-fisted with his affection and approval, I think that's why Tyrion and Cersei are so desperate and so hungry for just a scrap of affection and approval, which is why they have this absurd sibling rivalry throughout the books. There's no reason why Tyrion, why Tyrion and Cersei should be should be fighting. They are on the same side. They are both trying to keep Joffrey on the throne and, and Tywin and the Lannister regime in power. They're, they w both want to defeat Stannis. They both want to, you know, punish any disloyal people. They are on the same side. But because they 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 see getting love from Tywin as a zero-sum game, they, they think that only one of them can be Tywin's favourite. And so, and so they fight against each other, and and they destroy themselves, and and that's the tragedy of the Lannister family. This this incestuous, corrupt, dysfunctional, toxic family destroy themselves because of their like internal emotional uh, bullshit, and mostly because of Tywin. It all comes down from Tywin. Like it's like Tyrion thinks, like it all goes back and back to our fathers and their fathers before them. We are puppets dancing on their strings. That toxicity has come down generation after generation and and it's even dripping down from from Cersei to Lancel it's trickled it's trickled down toxinomics that that was bad but you know what I mean so uh so Tyrion just keeps on being like sarcastic about Lancel and uh they mentioned that Cersei originally tried to get 
uh, Gold Cloak Commander Jessel and Bywater to release Pycelle, but but Bywater refused because Jessel and is loyal to Tyrion, and and Tyrion hadn't okayed it. And you know, so so we're seeing that Jessel and Bywater is, is doing what he wants Tyrion, what Tyrion wants him to do, because of course you know Jenos Slint was originally the commander of the Gold Cloaks, and Tyrion kicked him out and replaced him with Jessel. And Jessel and Bywater wasn't included in the TV show, but in the books he's one of uh, Tyrion's allies in, in book two. He's loyal to him, but he dies at the end of book two, so Tyrion is is deprived of him eventually. I, in the show, they sort of replaced Jessel and with with Bronn, I suppose, is his you know loyal dude with a sword and, and I, that, that that works I suppose that's reasonable uh, and Lancel tries to sort of intimidate uh, Tyrion and you know have a care how you speak to me imp and like touches his sword but Tyrion thinks that the absurd whip, wisp of a mustache on Lancel's lip kind of ruins the effect of his intimidation and, and, and it's funny because like you know I mean like Tyrion just sort of threatens Lancel back, you know, he says, oh, you know, let go of your sword. One cry from me and Shago will burst in and kill you with an axe, not a wineskin. So so Tyrion, you know, has like a much more forceful and a much more scary and a much more witty threat that he delivers to Lancel. Um, which which to me just says, like, like, Lancel and Tyrion are both just trying to intimidate and bully each other. The only difference is that Tyrion is good at it. That they're both being dickheads. <laughs> Tyrion's just better at it. Uh, if, if you're going to be a dick, you might as well be eloquent. But you're still a dick, so like, I don't think I don't think he really gets any any points here. Um, DDF star in the live chat says, "Did George R. R. Martin have daddy issues?" So I, I did a little bit of reading. Um, I think that I think that. George Martin hasn't talked a lot in detail about his father in interviews, uh, but he, but he has said that his father was a functioning alcoholic, and that they never really understood each other, and the only thing that they ever really bonded over was football. Um, George Martin has never said that his father was aggressive or, or hit him or, or was a shit dad, um, but you, you might speculate that that was the case to some extent. Um, he, he, he has not talked about it in detail as far as I can see, but I think that dynamic is, is probably there. Yeah. Like, it's not hard to imagine. And, you know, I, I, it might not be good form to, like, speculate on the family dynamics of living authors, but, you know, like, like, George being a nerd, like, he's talked about, you know, he was a nerd at school and he was bullied, like, just, just like Tyrion was, you know, bullied and feels bitterness and, and resentment. Um, and when George Martin's dream is to be a sci-fi writer, I don't imagine that his, like, father, who was, you know, the only thing they understood about each other was football, I, I don't see George Martin getting a lot of approval from his father through his <laughs> dorky science fiction writing career, you know? So, one could imagine a dynamic between George Martin and his father in which, uh, George feels starved of approval and affection and feels like his father is stern and cold and maybe that informs the tyrion Tywin relationship. One could speculate that that might be the case. I don't know if it is. Uh, the thing that I really don't want to think about is Tyrion's, is, is George Martin's relationship to his sisters. Because George Martin has two sisters uh, and I, I, if I was George's sisters, I would have questions about the about the incest going on in his book. So I would not be very comfortable with that. But anyway, moving on. Um, so they t- so Lancel's talking to Tyrion, uh, and Tyrion finally accuses Lancel of having sex with Cersei. And Tyrion wasn't actually 100% sure that it was true, but like the reaction that Lancel has to the accusation confirms to Tyrion that he is having sex with Cersei. Um, and so, yeah, like, in the TV show, Tyrion figures it out for himself that Lancel is having sex with Cersei. Um, but in the books, Varys told Tyrion. Varys told it true, Tyrion thinks. And it's interesting that Varys would tell Tyrion that, because, you know, Tyrion... Varys is not, like, entirely loyal to Tyrion. He has his own plans with regards to, you know, young Griff and sowing chaos to undermine the realm and whatnot. I wonder if Varys told... Tyrion about Lancel uh, in order to give Tyrion ammunition to increase conflict between Cersei and Tyrion. I wonder if he's trying to sort of create conflict there. But then again, like, 
what was it? like like in the scene in book one when Illyrio and Varys are talking in the basement with the dragon skulls. Um, I I think Illyrio was saying, "You've got to, you've got to speed things up," and Varys was saying, "You got to slow things down with regards to building conflict in Westeros." Or was it the other way around? I forget. Someone tell me in the comments. But yeah, I don't know. I can't remember if Varys is trying to slow things. Whatever. Anyway, so so Tyrion accuses Lancel of having sex with Cersei, uh, and he and Tyrion threatens to tell Joffrey. What will Joffrey do when I tell him that you murdered his father, Robert, to bed his mother, Cersei? And Lancel's like, oh my god, it wasn't like that. I swear to god. And, uh, and Tyrion thinks about how, like, oh, you know, Lancel is not as handsome as Jaime, and his hair is more of a sandy colour than, like, a spun gold colour. But, you know, a poor copy of Jamie is better than an empty bed. So Cersei has a type, uh, and Cersei's type is relatives. <laughs> um, but, but but I think, like, the whole, the whole incest theme with the Lannisters, like, especially for Cersei, is that it's basically about narcissism. Like, Cersei is sexually attracted to people who look like her, and that's why she has sex with her twin, who, who looks so much like her that they were almost identical as children. She, 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 she'd fuck a mirror if she could. Uh, you, you'd probably need to go to a specialty sex store for that. I'm sure it's possible. But but it's narcissism. Um, and, and, you know, there is a difference between, like, Cersei and Jamie's love. Um, because Jamie is faithful to Cersei, while Cersei is not faithful to Jamie. Um, and I think that there might be some kind of more sincerity in Jamie's love for Cersei than, there, than Cersei's love for Jamie. Because Cersei so, is so manipulative of Jamie and Jamie is not manipulative of Cersei. But you know, on the other hand, like I think Jamie just doesn't think about things very much. Um and 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 superficiality is not the same thing as sincerity. Or maybe it is. I I think that I think that sometimes being sincere means not having ulterior motives and not having hidden agendas. I think I think the more you think, the less honest and sincere you are unless you're sharing all of your thoughts like like sincerity means and honesty means fully understanding each other transparently right and the more thoughts you have the more you have to communicate in order to stay completely honest and sincere if you have very few thoughts and feelings and you are honest about those thoughts and feelings you are being sincere so i i think that the the, the more complex and thoughtful you are the less honest you can be. Unless you just communicate every goddamn thought you have. I've always been suspicious of thoughts. I feel like thoughts are mostly things that we use to justify what we were going to do anyway. I think thoughts are used to rationalise the opinions we already have and the behaviours we already have. I think thoughts come after our personality and our actions, not before. We'd like to think that we think and that we make a decision and then we act. But I think a lot of the time we act or we feel and we act and then we have thoughts later to justify what we just did. I think we'd be better off if we didn't have thoughts. Okay, moving on. Um, so Cersei's fucking Lancel. Um, and Lancel's like, oh, look, I was just doing I was just doing what I was told. I didn't mean to, you know, do this thing. Because obviously it's scandalous to be having sex with uh, the queen. Not entirely sure why, because, I mean, the kings are allowed to have as many mistresses as they like, but apparently queens are not, so, you know, hashtag patriarchy, hashtag topical. Um, but it would be a scandal if this was known. Um, tre treasonous, apparently. Um, and, and Lancel's like, oh, I, I was just doing it because I was told to. And, th and then Tyrion's like, oh, you hated every instant of it. Is that what you're telling me? A high place at court, knighthood, and my sister's legs opening for you at night. Oh, yes, it must have been terrible. And, 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 and again, I think there's sort of that envy coming in. Like, I, th I think that Tyrion is jealous of Lancel for his handsomeness, his youth, his status, the fact that people don't mock him as an imp, you know? And and I also think there might be a hint of envy about having sex with Cersei. Like, Tyrion makes several comments throughout the series about sex with Cersei. Like, like in, I think, Tyrion 1, A Clash of Kings, uh, he's talking to Cersei and they talk about the fact that Cersei has sex with Jaime. Uh, Tyrion knows and Cersei knows he knows. 
Um, and Tyrion makes a comment about like, oh, you know, I think it's a bit unfair that you open your legs for one brother and not the other. Um, he, he makes like he makes like a couple of comments like that about about sort of implying that he wants to have sex with Cersei. And then in book five, um, when Tyrion goes like full nihilist, full villain, full cynic, full vengeance, horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, Tyrion says he wants to kill Cersei and Jaime, and he says that he wants to kill and rape his sister Cersei. And it's like, well, is Tyrion being serious about that? Um, is this just an empty threat? Is, is this rape purely like a brutal, violent, awful punishment in a similar way that Tywin uses rape as a weapon, like for example, with Tysha? Um, but but I, I've got this horrible feeling that like T- Tyrion's threat to rape Cersei might actually be grounded in some actual desire to rape Cersei, based on these comments that he makes about like opening Cersei's legs and one brother not the other. Like I think there might actually be some genuine desire there in in like a really horrible way. Uh, I mean, if only because like Tyrion, T- like like Jaime makes a comment that Tyrion always wanted to be Jaime when they were growing up. Um, Tyrion wishes he was tall like Jaime, Tyrion wishes he was a warrior like Jaime, Tyrion wishes he was handsome like Jaime, and maybe in some sense, sort of along with those feelings, he wants to be with Cersei like Jaime. Um, I don't think Tyrion will rape Cersei, to be clear. I, I think that I think that Cersei's destiny lies with Jaime um, under the Red Keep, though hopefully not in quite the way that it happened in Season 8. But yeah, there are some really like uncomfortable vibes going on with with Tyrion and his like sexual attitude towards Cersei. Uh, so that's one of many sort of weird, gross things that they whitewashed out of the TV show. Uh, I think one of the things about the TV show is that the TV show had this logic where like when a character is popular uh, on the TV show, uh, and and when the showrunners like one of the actors they tend to make them more virtuous and less villainous. They whitewash the character in a way that often makes them boring. And I think the biggest example of that is Tyrion, obviously. Um, Because he's such a good guy in the later seasons, and yet in the books he's so much more complex and so much darker. And and, and the sort of the ironic thing is that, like, you know, I imagine that, you know... D&D or whatever, you know, that they think, oh, Peter Dinklage, such a great actor, such a popular guy, so we've got to make sure Tyrion is a good character. But, like, being morally good as a character is not the same thing as being an interesting and effective story uh, character and an interesting performance in in a story. I, I think that by, by whitewashing Tyrion, they did a massive disservice, not only to Tyrion as a character and to Peter Dinklage as an actor. They just made him a less, they just made him less interesting. They gave Peter Dinklage less to do. If you, if you go rewatch like season seven and season eight, 90% of what Tyrion Lannister does in the last two seasons of Game of Thrones is stand around and look sad. He looks sad watching Jon burn Daenerys. He looks sad watching Daenerys burn King's Landing. He looks sad when, when he's, he arrives at Winterfell and and Cersei does I, I, he, he just stands there looking impotent he's an impotent imp he stands there being an impotent sad imp doing nothing because oh he has good intentions but he can't do anything about it it's so it's boring they turned the most interesting character in the books into a boring milk toast vanilla slice good guy and it's unforgivable Thanks for the super chat from Sarang, who says, Do you disagree, like a growing number of people do these days, with Chomsky's notion that language is the very basis of all thought? Uh, I don't know about Noam Chomsky's opinions about language and and thought. Um, It would be difficult to think without language, wouldn't it? Like, when humans hadn't invented language yet, do you think that we couldn't think in a detailed way. We could only just have immediate, like, feelings and impulses and imaginings. How could how could we have complex thoughts without complex language to describe it, you know? Try having a thought. I mean, you can think visually, but you can't think very abstractly without language. I don't know. I, don't know. I haven't got the answers. Not in the middle of this Game of Thrones live stream, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so Tyrion and, and Lancel are doing their thing, and um, and Lancel gets on his knees, and he says, "Mercy, my lord, I beg you, don't don't tell Joffrey that I've been sleeping with Cersei." And t- and Tyrion sort of like you know, uh, uh, negatively says, "Oh, save it for Joffrey. He likes a good beg." 
but likes it but like Tyrion likes a good beg too Tyrion obviously enjoys having people groveling at his knees and that's why he humiliated Pycelle and humiliated General Slint and his humiliating Lancel Tyrion likes to have people groveling at his feet because he's been bullied all his life and it makes him a bad person in my opinion. Yeah, there's this moment where Tyrion, he, he sits the Iron Throne at one point, in his capacity as Hand of the King in this book, and he he looks down upon them all from the Iron Throne and he finds that he likes it, is the line. Which is almost identical to Cersei Lannister's first line in Cersei Lannister's first POV chapter in Book 4, when she, when she thinks she sat high above them all on the Iron Throne um and and she liked it oh no no her first line is like she dreamed she sat the iron throne and looked down upon them all it's almost the same line it's so funny and so ironic that Tyrion and Cersei are fighting each other so vehemently um and yet they have so many of the same desires and same insecurities they both want power they both are proud they both feel resentful and spiteful and vindictive they both want tywin's love like they both feel like they've been mistreated Tyrion because he's a dwarf and cersei because she's a woman that they, they are such similar characters <laughs> Um and and perhaps that's why they fight so much. Like like Jamie gets along with both Cersei and and Tyrion most of the time. I think because Jamie does not desire the same things in the same ways. Like Jamie does not feel uh like he's been treated unfairly because he he hasn't been because he's a tall handsome warrior man. Um and he doesn't have the same desire for power. Um, and he doesn't have the same desire for affection from Tywin. Well, he does a bit, but not like as much because it hasn't been withhold- withheld that much. Uh, I think I think part of the reason why people fight each other sometimes is because they're similar and they want the same things, which makes sense. Like if I want apples from an elephant bucket and you want oranges from the orange tree, we're not going to fight. I'll have the apples. You have the oranges. All good, homie. Um, but if someone else wants the apples from that elephant bucket, you, there's going to be a bit of fucking biffo. You better believe. Better fucking believe we're going to scrap over those apples. I, You wouldn't believe the things I've done for an apple out of a bucket. Uh, and that's when conflict happens. It's when you want the same desires. And that's why, like, you know, hashtag Durkheim... Uh, society works when there's a division of labor and people produce different things that they can then share for mutual gain. You go get some apples, I go get some oranges, and if I need some, like, we can swap the fruits depending on our needs. If my teeth are falling out, you give me the orange for the vitamin C, but otherwise I'll stick to my apples. We gotta, like, divide and, and conquer, you know? Uh, division of labor. Uh, but since Tyrion and Cersei want the same things, they fight for them, tooth and claw. Um, so Lancel is groveling for Tyrion, uh, and Lancel just totally crumbles. He he falls to pieces like a, like a fuck like a like a like a damp graham cracker, and he says, "I'll leave the city. It's like I was never here. I'll end it. I'll never have sex with her again." Uh, he totally crumbles. Um, and Tyrion thinks, Tyrion says, no, I think not. I want you to stay with Cersei, pleasure her as often as she requires it, keep her trust, stay by her side, as long as you keep faith with me. Spy on her, tell me her plans, tell me what she's up to, and then you can, you can keep at it. And so Lancel says, yes, my lord, he said, without a moment's hesitation, and Tyrion liked that. Quote unquote. So again, like this is all about feeding Tyrion's ego. This is not like a very useful strategic thing. Like, like yes, like it's a good idea to keep an eye on Cersei because Cersei can be uh, unpredictable and counterproductive and destructive. It's a good idea to keep an eye on Cersei. Yes, but the people who Tyrion should really be worrying about and the people who Tyrion should be spying on is bloody Littlefinger, who is actively, like, causing war, and who framed Tyrion, and who Tyrion knows it, but he's not doing anything about it, and Varys, who is a total wild card, and, like, I don't know, Stannis, the guy who's trying to in- invade their city, Daenerys with the dragons, there are so many people who Tyrion should be spying on, and should be examining, but, but he's fighting Cersei instead, because it all comes back to these family dynamics, and the sibling rivalry for Tywin's love, and, and all of that nonsense. 
Um, thanks for the donation from Renark, who says, Man, the show really minimized Tyrion's more negative aspects, didn't it? I think it would have been a lot more interesting if they kept him true to his character. I absolutely agree. Thanks for the super chat from Caroline, who says, How long do you think that Tyrion has known about Cersei and Jaime banging? Like, when do you think he found out? That's a good question. I would speculate that, like, Tyrion and Jaime have been, like... Uh, Tyrion, Jamie has been Tyrion's best friend all his life. Like, Tyrion doesn't really have any friends that we know of. I mean, you know, there's Bronn and Shay, who he pays. But aside from employees, uh, Tyrion doesn't have friends um, th- that are mentioned in the text. And that's another similarity to Cersei, because Cersei talks about how she, she has never really had close friends, except for Malara, who she murdered. Um... So my point is that I imagine that, that Jamie and Tyrion would confide in each other. And I imagine that Jamie might have just told Tyrion about about the sex that he was having with Cersei. Like, I... And Jamie hasn't always been very careful about keeping that secret. Like, you know, even later on, he just he straight up just wants to make it public. He doesn't want to hide it anymore. Um, and it seems like he's the more sort of rash one who wants to have sex in Baylor's Sept and in, like, the Broken Tower at Winterfell. I think Jamie might just tell Tyrion. And, and also, like, even if he didn't tell him, um, Tyrion might find out. Because, you know, word gets around in a castle. Tyrion knows Jamie and Cersei better than anyone, probably. Tyrion is perceptive. Like, I, I think Tyrion may have may have worked it out himself. Um, and, and, you know, they were doing it since childhood. And, and also, like, there was that incident where Joanna Lannister um, found... Uh, Cersei and Tyr- and Jamie having sex when they were children, uh, and told them n- not to do it ever again. Uh, so it's not like only Jamie and Cersei knew. Joanna knew. I mean, she died giving birth to Tyrion, but like other people might have found out. Um, and Tywin is nothing if not uh, willfully blind. You know, like I, it wouldn't surprise me if other people like at Castle Rock know about the incest. Like, like servants and stuff, you know? Like, you'd, you'd find out. And I think they might be too afraid to speak, because Tywin would probably rip their tongues out. Um, but it, it wouldn't even surprise me if, like, it was a semi-known thing around Castle Rock. I'm really looking forward to going to Castle Rock. I, I, I think that George R. R. Martin might have said at one point that we will uh, see Castle Rock at some point. We, we did see it in the TV show at one point, in season 7. And it was extremely underwhelming. It didn't look like Castle Rock at all. It was more of a castle pebble in the TV show. Um, but it would be really cool to see Castle Rock and to see like what the deal is. Um, oh yeah, Chin Okonoko in the live chat says that Kevin knows about the incest. That's true. So yeah, like I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's even that much of a secret necessarily. I, I mean, I mean, Kevin may have only figured it out after Stannis sent the letters everywhere about Joffrey being an incest baby. Um, but yeah, how, how, how widely known it was known before the series, I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, Liam, Liam in the live chat says, it would be a weird thing to bring up in conversation. I mean, true, true. Like imagine like Tyrion and Jamie just sitting there having a beer and Jamie's like, oh yeah. So, so anyway, uh, I was banging our sister the other day. It doesn't seem like it, like something that would naturally come up in conversation, does it? But, you know, they confide in each other. Like, like, like T- Tyrion told Jamie once, uh, before the events of the series, uh, that whores will fuck you blind, but most of them won't kiss you. That's something that Jamie remembers Tyrion telling him, like, years ago. Um, so Tyrion and Jamie talk about who they have sex with, with each other, is what that tells us. Um, you know, men talk, women talk, but men talk too. So, you know. Maybe Jamie told Tyrion in some way. So, Tyrion is uh, telling Lancel to spy on Cersei for him. Uh, and Tyrion says, Ah, oh, well, you know, smile, Lancel. My sister is a beautiful woman, and it's all for the good of the realm. Uh, you could do well out of this. I could give you a lordship if you stay loyal to me. So, Tyrion's really giving Lancel the carrot and the stick. He's saying he'll dob him into Joffrey if he doesn't stay in line, but he's also offering him a lordship, which is what <laughs> it's what Tyrion does. Bribery is Tyrion's like first move. He's like first instinct is to 
jangle gold at people's faces to try and make him do what they want. Which, which I guess, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it. Tyrion hasn't got much else to flaunt. Cersei flaunts her body as as a in- incentive, as a bribe to make people follow her, like like the Kettle Blacks, like Ned Stark. It's so funny in the books when Cersei tries to, like, seduce Ned Stark to get him to not... Uh, reveal her incest and, and everything. Like, you really think Ned Stark is is going to betray his principles for a bit of a ride on the on the lion? Uh, not going to happen. But Cersei, Cersei just takes a swing anyway. Like, th- there's no one she won't uh, try to bribe with sex. Um, Tyrion conversely uses uses gold, and Jamie, I suppose, uses violence because um, that, that's what he's got. Whatever you know, you gotta learn what you got in this world, I suppose. Um, and it's Cersei who says that you know tears are not a woman's only weapon. You also have the one between your legs. So depressingly, sometimes sex is the only thing that women in Westeros have as a tool to survive in the world, and and sh- that's what Shay's doing, right? Shay's um, surviving off off her off the fruit of her loins, because um, that's all she's got. She's a commoner. She's eighteen years old. What the fuck else is her option? Does she want to be a, a a candle maker? What was Shay's father's profession again? It's not a candle maker, but it's something similar. Um, and in the books, it wasn't in the TV show, but in the books. Uh, Shay said that her father tried to make her his whore, and so she ran away and became a whore. Um, although I think she complained that like making the the bread or whatever her father's trade was was as annoying to her as as the incestuous sexual assault was. So look, it's it's you know, mm, come on, George. But like. Yeah, patriarchy, sex, that's what's going on. Um, so Tyrion is dominating Lancel, um, phrasing, um, and Tyrion says, Go and tell Cersei that I want no more conflict between us, and and I'll give up Pycelle as well. I'll give her Pycelle just to convince Cersei that we're all G, and so that Cersei doesn't suspect that Lancel is spying on her. Uh, which again makes you question: What was the point of arresting and imprisoning and humiliating Pycelle if you're just going to free him again not long afterwards? All Tyrion accomplishes with his whole like he thinks he's so clever because you know he feeds false information to like Pycelle, Littlefinger, and Varys, and like to figure out who is the disloyal one, and and Pycelle is found out as being disloyal. But like the problem with that whole scheme is that Varys and Littlefinger are also extremely disloyal. If I sell, was just the only one stupid enough to get caught. So all Tyrion did uh, w- w- was make Pycelle into an enemy when he when he really didn't need to be, and he fails to act against the actually dangerous people, Littlefinger and Varys. So like, Var- Tyrion's really fitting his ego, but he's not actually accomplishing as much as he thinks. Um, and yeah, Tyrion suggests that like, oh, you know, maybe I'll get rid of Jocelyn Bywater. Because Cersei wants to get rid of him, and so... Blah, blah. And, like, Tyrion advises Lancel not to get Cersei pregnant, and they talk about coming on her belly instead of inside her. Moisten her belly as often as you wish, but see that your dew falls nowhere else. There's a lot of focus. Like, Tyrion is focusing a lot on his sister and her having sex. It's all incestuous and uncomfortable. Uh, and and then Lancel leaves, uh, with Tyrion having successfully intimidated him into being his spy. And Tyrion allows himself for a moment to feel sorry for the boy. A few chapters ago, a, a, a river lord from the Riverlands came to King's Landing and said, Hey Tyrion, uh, y- your Lannister soldiers are raping, burning, and killing innocent people all across the Riverlands. Please stop. And Tyrion's response was, meh, that's war. Uh, war crimes, atrocities, eh, I don't care. And yet, and he didn't feel sorry for any of those civilians, or for that river lord, or for anyone, but he does feel sorry for Lancel. Like, it, it's so weird, the people who Tyrion does and does not feel sorry for. Like, mostly he only sympathizes with people who remind him of himself. He feels sorry for Bran, uh, because Bran is a quote-unquote cripple. Um, he feels sorry for Barra's mother, the sex worker who's murdered by Janos Lint and Aladim. 
um, because whores remind Tyrion of Taisha and Shay, who he loves. Um, he feels sorry for Sansa, um, but but his sympathies do not extend far beyond other noble people and people like himself. Um, common people, Tyrion. I I I do not think Tyrion ever sympathizes with any common people except the ones he's having sex with. That that's about as far as Tyrion's empathy goes. Uh, maybe he's not a good person. He he just doesn't care about common people, which I'm sure is a pathology common to noble people, you know, even in the real world, you know. Like it it I mean you you ask uh, an American how much they care about an American life, and you compare that with with how much they call a, care about a Syrian life or a Yemeni life, and you'll you'll get a different answer. The rich tend not to care about the poor or or people who belong to a different social class as them. That that's not new. Uh, but it doesn't make Tyrion anything any less of a dick. Moving on. Uh, so Tyrion has just uh, so so Tyrion muses and thinks about how Lancel is probably going to die, um, because you know if Jaime finds out that Lancel's having sex with Cersei, Jaime will probably kill Lancel, um, which funnily enough turns out to be false because in book four uh, Jaime goes to uh, fucking Rosby to go meet Lancel Lannister largely because he wants to find out if it's true that Lancel's fucking Cersei, uh, which is what Tyrion said. Um, and I think, no, I, I think Jamie concludes that Lancel could not possibly have been having sex with Cersei because of how weak and pious and pathetic Lancel becomes at that point. Uh, but of course, Jamie's mistaken. But, but you know, it, it, like, I don't, I don't know if Jamie even would kill Lancel at this point because Jamie is so disillusioned with Cersei that I... I don't think he would react in that way. But, but yeah, like, like, you know, like, Tyrion muses in this chapter that, I mean, Lancel's really screwed. Like, he's stuck between Tyrion and Cersei and Jaime. One of them's gonna kill him as soon as he steps out of line. As long as he, as soon as he becomes, um, as soon as he becomes inconvenient, Lancel is a goner. Um, and, and that's the tragedy, because it's not just Lancel, it's all these bloody Riverlanders and these peasants as well. All these people who are just caught inside what is essentially a, a personal family drama feud, like t- Tywin's insecurities, Tywin's pride, um, in so many ways led to this war. Uh, and you know, Joffrey's uh, cruelty, killing Ned, is also a major contributing factor. But like, I-, I think what is so fascinating about this story, in a lot of ways, is that uh, I-, I think what makes it such potent drama is that it is. It, it has a personal human micro scale in the sense that it's about individual human family relationships. This is a story about families, the Lannister family, the Stark family, the Tully family, the, the Martell family, and all of the personal emotional relationships, which is super relatable. Um, I mean, you know, not the incest and the murder, hopefully, but but the feelings, the, the, the father issues, the mother issues, the ambitions, the hopes, the dreams, the, the, the fears. It's all relatable human drama. Um, but, but Game of Thrones is also epic in scale because it's kingdoms and it's armies and it's dragons and it's castles and it's warfare. And, and the reason why that works is that the medieval feudal setting... Uh, is uniquely it, it uniquely connects the micro family drama to the macro warfare political scale um, because only in a medieval feudal society is it of continental significance who's rooting who the fact that Cersei was in love with her brother instead of her husband and had Joffrey as an incest baby which makes him an illegitimate king like 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 that the, the, those sexual proclivities could only have so much significance in a medieval setting. In a modern democratic country, if a president uh, gets a gets a blowy under the desk, uh, that can be a big deal. Um, but it doesn't have the massive dynastic continental inter kingdom warfare consequences. Uh, that it does in Game of Thrones. Medieval feudalism connects the personal and the emotional to the political um, in a way that nothing else does. 
And I think that's part of what's so cool about A Song of Ice and Fire and why the drama is so effective. Um, all right. So, and, and, and like Game of Thrones season eight and season seven, like, like you know, Zeynep Tefeki wrote about how Game of Thrones got worse because it no longer had a sociological uh, underpinning. And I think that is sort of getting at a similar point, which is that what makes Game of Thrones good is is that connection between the macro political and the micro personal. And I think that the later seasons failed uh, to connect the political with the personal. It failed to connect uh, what was going on with the common people, what was going on with the armies, what was going on with the with the dynastic political grand strategy. It failed to connect that stuff with what was going on with the personal lives of the characters, and that's part of why the later seasons of Game of Thrones failed. So, um, so Tyrion kicks out Lancel, and Tyrion feels a restlessness and he knows full well he'll not get back to sleep and so he decides to go and see Shay. The implication possibly being that dominating Lancel made Tyrion horny. It's a little bit like when like Cersei gets kind of horny from like watching the Tower of the Hand burn. Um, power turns on these Lannisters is I think what's going on. Um... So that's another gross similarity between Tyrion and Cersei. But Tyrion decides he, he wants to go and see Shay. And Tyrion continues being like kind of a sarcastic dickhead. <laughs> um, like he tells Podrick to go and uh, get some horses. And Podrick's like, uh, horses? Because like this poor boy, like Podrick's like what, like nine years old in, in book two? Uh, he's being woken up from sleep uh, to be servant to Tyrion. And, and, and Tyrion's like, yeah, horses. Those big brown animals that love apples. Um, being a sarcastic dickhead. That that could as well describe me, honestly. Um, but but he goes and tells Podrick to go and find some horses. And then Podrick... Then Bronn asks who pissed in his soup. And, and, and I don't know, Tyrion... Tyrion's like, oh, are all, are all sellswords as clever as you, Bronn? Tyrion is being so patronizing to people. And so they ride along... Uh, on the way to Shatea's brothel, and they go down Shadow Black Lane and thence onto Pig Run Alley. I would love to know how Pig Run Alley got its name. Like, was was there some kind of porcine athletic incident? Was there some kind of a bacon marathon <laughs> that led to the the name Pig Run Alley? Or, or maybe there was some kind of... Uh, uh, some kind of incident with a thresher and a herd of pigs that, that, that made a large liquid quantity of pork run down the alley, like, like, a, like a river run made of bacon. Uh, the imagination runs wild. Um, and, and anyway, so, th- so the moon is sort of watching them as they ride through the night. The moon is playing peek and sneak among the chimneys, because apparently peek and sneak is the Westerosi term for hide and seek, which is very adorable. It is funny, like, the tiny little microscopic um, differences, like, the language differences between Westeros and, and like, like English, like, our language. Um, like, like, sir is spelt S-E-R instead of S-I-R. And like all the all the names are changed. It's so it's so funny and like unnecessary to me that like you know Robert is spelled R O B E T T sometimes, and like Catelyn instead of Catherine, and Eddard instead of Edward. Like it's it's it, 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 all those tiny little changes that that George makes just to make the world slightly more unfamiliar. Um, which I, I don't know if it's necessary. Uh, I mean, I it, it it works, I guess, but you know. Uh, and it's night time, and Tyrion sees a, a lone old crone carrying a dead cat by the tail, and she looks fearful, and then she walks away. And, you know, like, like you know, Tyrion doesn't have any sympathy for her. He has sympathy for goddamn Lancel Lannister, wispy beard, young knight, Root the Queen Lancel. He doesn't feel any sympathy for this poor old woman who is eating dead cats because that's the best you can find in this starving city. Like, goddamn Tyrion, have some sympathy for her. Uh, and then Tyrion just sort of internally, he just compliments himself a lot 
Um, he, he just thinks that, ooh, like, you know, Ned Stark and John Aaron, they were too honest. They were too noble to shit. But I am smart because I play Cersei's game. And, you know, I, Tyrion has never felt more alive. Uh, this dance he knows. So he, he feels very impressed with himself. Um, he feels like he's doing a great job of being Hand of the King and being a smart politician. But in so many ways, Tyrion fails. Like, he, he, like, he dominates Lancel and Pycelle and Janos. Uh, although, you know, Janos just becomes Jon Snow's problem and Pycelle helps condemn Tyrion later. But he never figures out Littlefinger. He never figures out Varys. Um, the, the Kettle Blacks, Osmond, Osfred, and Os, Osgiliath Kettle Black, is that his name? <laughs> Fucking, fucking orangutan kettle black. Fucking, uh, orange whip kettle black. What's his name? Uh, the, the kettle blacks. Cersei hires the kettle blacks, but Tyrion, like, counter hires the kettle blacks. He, like, bribes the kettle blacks to spy for him instead. So Tyrion has multiple sets of spies on Cersei already. Uh, but we find out in the next book that the kettle blacks were actually secretly working for Littlefinger all along, not Tyrion or Cersei. Uh, so Tyrion fails to control the Kettle Blacks. Uh, his plot to free Jaime in this book fails. Uh, his plot to make a marriage alliance with the Dornish by giving them Macella uh, fails because the Dornish do not help uh, the Lannisters. And indeed, the Dornish, like Ariane Martell, uses Macella against the Lannisters in her Queenmaker plot, and Macella gets cut up. So Tyrion's Macella Dawn thing fails. Um, and, and ultimately, his whole attempt to, you know, hold on to power and, and control everything fails when he gets uh, condemned to death for a murder he didn't do. And all the people who he humiliated and lorded over and bullied turn against him and condemn him. So, so Tyrion is nowhere near as successful as he thinks he is. He does, to his credit, defend King's Landing from Stannis. Which, you know, again, is not an ethical thing because Stannis is the rightful king and Stannis is a less... Not terrible king than Joffrey. Uh, but even that, like, Tyrion probably would not have won the Battle of Blackwater if it wasn't for Tywin and the Tyrells. Um, so, I, Tyrion... And, and, you know, ultimately the Lannister regime collapses under Cersei the minute Tyrion leaves. Uh, and the White Walkers are the real problem, which doesn't even happen. Uh, Liam in the live chat points out that, yeah, even the wildfire that he uses to beat Stannis at the Blackwater was Cersei's idea. Yeah, that's right. And, like, he did have the chain. He did do the chain, which helps uh, hold the Stannis' fleet in while it's being burned. So, yeah, that's that's about one of the biggest things that he actually does that actually works. Um, and, and Garland Tyrell um, praises him for that uh, in, the, in the next book. But, yeah... Tyrion is not as smart as he thinks. And he goes to Shatea's brothel. Um, and he chats with Shatea, uh, and he thinks that she's a handsome woman, and he has seldom seen such elegance and dignity in a whore. Uh, though she, as a summer islander, she sees herself more as a kind of a priestess. Because uh, in the Summer Islands, they see sex as being a holy rite. Uh, and so Tyrion thinks, perhaps that's the secret. It's not what we do, it's why we do it. And the thought comforts him. And, and I think the reason why that comforts him is that Tyrion realises that what he's doing is not really ethical. But he just tells himself that he's he's doing these Machiavellian brutal things for good reasons. What one of the interesting moments earlier in the book is when Tyrion Tyrion uh he 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 removes Janos Slint and he has Aladim killed because Janos and uh Aladim killed uh Barra, the baby Barra and Barra's mother. Um but then so so Tyrion says to himself, I'm doing justice. That's what he says at the start of the book. I'm doing justice as hand of the king. But then at the end of that chapter, Tyrion asks Bronn, Hey Bronn, if I asked you to kill a baby, would you do it? And Bronn says, Yeah, I'd kill a baby for the right price. A and then Tyrion feels despair. Cause cause in that moment Tyrion realizes he's just as bad as the people he's replacing. Tyrion is a ruthless manipulator who employs amoral cutthroats just like everyone else like like is Tyrion really better than the people he's replacing the answer is kind of no the answer is Tyrion kind of is a villain and he kind of knows it but he tells himself that oh you know I have good intentions so it's different 
Sure, I'm supporting a murderous, incestuous, illegitimate, tyrannical, brutal uh, regime that burns whole kingdoms out of Tywin's petty pride and retribution. But no, I'm a good guy because I'm the dwarf. I'm the underdog. I'm trying to do my best, man. Uh, and I think that that's just Tyrion's thoughts. Because remember, thoughts are not to be trusted. Ty Tyrion is just rationalizing his bad behavior, telling himself that he's doing it for a good reason. And so I'm just as elegant and dignified as Chitea. Uh He... Uh, is a little worried about the other patrons at the brothel because they're looking at him uh, darkly. Uh, last time he came out, a man spit on Tyrion on the streets because uh, the people of King's Landing hate Tyrion. They think that he's a twisted demon monkey dwarf. Um, and when the, when the man spit on Tyrion, Bronn uh, broke his teeth, which I'm sure is a great way to win over the common people, Tyrion. Yeah, just just smash up the faces of the people who don't like you. That'll make some friends. That's one of Tyrion's other failures, is that the common people hate him, and that's part of what gets him condemned, and it also leads to the riot at King's Landing, or contributes to the riot. Uh, and Tyrion utterly fails to do anything to win the common people over. He does provide some food for the common people at one point, but, like, he he fails to address that problem sufficiently. Uh, and then another sex worker called Dancy comes along and tries to get Tyrion to hook up with her. He s she slides into his lap and nibbles at his ear, which, which is a pretty bold opening gambit. I'd, I'd say Go, going right for the ear nibble that's that's, that's pretty strong play uh you know she's bold you got to give her that uh but Tyrion insists that she's going to go and see Alayaya instead because Tyrion uh goes and sees Alayaya because he's using the secret tunnel from Chitea's brothel to uh, a bit further out from the city so he can go and see Shay secretly and so Dancy tries her best to seduce Tyrion uh, she is described as pug-nosed and bouncy. Oof. Um, but Tyrion refuses her advances. Um, because, as it turns out, Dancy has made a bet with another sex worker called Marae, uh, and she's hoping to convince Tyrion to choose her instead of Alayaya, and there's some jewellery on the line uh, being bet. Uh, but alas, I think Marae is going to get the jewellery. Um... And Tyrion thinks about how, no, no, he's not going to have sex with those other women. Shay may be only a whore, but I am faithful to her, after my fashion. Uh, and Alayaya is going to sleep while Tyrion goes and sees Shay. Tyrion says that sleep is good and books are better, because Alayaya is learning how to read. Um, and he gets he goes through the tunnel, the secret tunnel that was Loki probably built by Tywin so that he can go and see sex workers, because uh, Tywin is a massive fucking hypocrite who sleeps with Shay. And Tyrion leaves from the secret tunnel and he rides his horse. His horse is a piebald gelding. I've got a lot of I've got questions about the terms piebald and gelding. Um, was it gelded by a pie? It's really horrifying. Like, like back in the day, I, I, I am told, um, eunuchs, like people without balls, boys without balls, were made by like when they're when they're really young. You get them in a hot bath, and and their testicles were like kneaded and massaged and like and like squashed gradually just into a fucking paste by just just people's fingers just just like rubbing the testicles until they break down into nothing. I, if I'm not mistaken, that is how eunuchs were made in, in some places and sometimes in history. Uh, which is so horrifying. I mean, they do similar things to, like, cows, um, like bulls and horses and things now, don't they? they? They put, like, those rings over the over the scrotums of these animals. And these rings, like, slowly constrict the blood flow to the testicles until they just go black and, and fall off. That's happening to millions of animals as we speak, which is very unpleasant. Um, why are we talking about balls? All right, so, so he rides the horse, um, and he hears some singing that reminds him of Taisha. Uh, because so often in George Martin's writings, songs are associated with memory, which again sort of connects to that whole like White Walkers being like the death of memory and representing forgetting theme. I, I, I think that 
that was like a weird thing the way that they did it in Game of Thrones season eight. But I think that that may be a theme that like emerges in the later Song of Ice and Fire books is that idea of songs being memory and death being forgetting. Um, there's a reason why he goes on about songs all the time. Um, so he's riding along and he thinks about how Tysha was a lie because uh, Tyrion at this point believes that Jaime had hired Tysha uh, to be with him and that she didn't really love him. And he thinks that I'm free of Tysha. She's haunted me half my life, but now I have Shay. And Shay is, is, is the girl for me. Which is so fucking tragic, because soon Shay will betray Tyrion in the most brutal way possible, and Tyrion will find out that Tysha actually was the one woman who's ever really, truly loved him. So it's a, it's a horrible emotional 180 that Tyrion has to go through, which devastates him at the end of book three, and really pushes him into this cynical, nihilistic, depressed space that he's in in book five. And so Tyrion arrives at the place where he's keeping Shay. It's a it's a manse, a nice little place where Shay's living. Uh, and Tyrion has given Shay guards who are all hideously ugly. There's a bravosi dagger man with a hair lip and a lazy eye. Uh, there's a bunch of foul smelling Ibanese. Uh, there's all these ugly people, and T- Tyrion has surrounded Shay with ugly people because he's paranoid that she's going to be attracted to someone other than himself. He is incredibly insecure um, that, that, that Shay's going to be unfaithful to him. And, you know, I mean, like, it's pathetic, but it's also there's also, like, an honesty to it, you know? Like, he realizes... He, he knows that he's hideous, um, and so he tries to be pragmatic about it by not, you know, tempting Shay to be with someone else. Although, of course, you know, it's also super controlling. It's not nice for Shay. Um, but, you know, Tyrion's trying to be pragmatic about his relation. But, like, you know, like, but, like, he's also admitting to himself that she doesn't really love him. Like, like, if Shay really loved him, he wouldn't need to surround her with hideously ugly people. If if it really was a loving, respecting relationship, he would be able to trust her to be faithful. Uh, but it's not a trusting, respectful relationship, as much as Tyrion occasionally wants to believe that that's the case. In the TV show, Shay really does come to love Tyrion. Uh, but in the books, Shay does not truly love Tyrion. George Martin, in an interview talked about how Shay does not give a shit about Tyrion. She's just in it for the money and the status. So that, that's another thing that they sort of... I mean, I wouldn't say whitewash, but, but like, you know, like like Sibel K- Kelly or whatever the actress's name is, um, they, they liked her and so they wanted to make more of her performance and more of her character. And I think that she was made a more interesting character by giving her a bit more agency and, and making her genuinely like Tyrion somewhat. That adds more emotional drama to her eventual betrayal of Tyrion, I think. So I think that works. Um, so yeah, anyway, so, so he goes and visits Shay uh, and she's asleep and he goes and wakes her up uh with a creative way and they have sex um and and Tyrion looks at Shay and he thinks how could a whore look so clean and sweet and innocent he wondered as though it's some goddamn mystery you know um and I you know it's this sort of medieval class status patriarchy thing I guess but you know it, it Tyrion thinks and and Tywin thinks I mean it's yeah it's not just the whole society uh, it's specifically Tywin um Tywin's influence because Tywin has this idea about whores and he has this idea that that women are just using sex to exploit men and humiliate men and they could never love you for real and that's why Tywin punishes Tysha even though Tysha was sincere in her affections for Tyrion Tywin thinks that no women women are just whores who want your money um, but but it's also this notion that like the moment you take money to have sex with someone, that changes not just your occupation. You know, sex work is apparently it's not just a day job; it's a whole identity as far as Westeros is concerned. Sex work is not just something that you do; a whore is what you are. You know, if you're an accountant, if you're a lumberjack. If, if you're someone who does something else for a living, you, you go and do that job, then you come home and you're just a person. But in the eyes of some, 
If you take money to have sex, that changes your fundamental moral composition. That changes who you are irrevocably. You're no longer just a person. You are a whore. You are a prostitute. That is your identity now. And I think that's why there's a push for the term sex work instead of like, you know, prostitute. Because the term sex work implies that, you know, it's a job, it's a thing that you can do, and it's not your entire identity, and it's something that should be subject to the same rights and basic human respect as any other profession. Uh, but that's not a concept that Tyrion has got his head around. Um, and so he has sex with Shay, uh, and then we're on the final page of the chapter. And Tyrion says, this is no dream. It is real, all of it. The wars, the intrigues, the great bloody game, and me at the center of it. Me, the dwarf, the monster, the one they scorned and laughed at, but now I hold it all. The power, the city, the girl. This is what I was made for, and gods forgive me, but I do love it. So goddamn... Doesn't that just lay it all out? Doesn't that just make it clear? Uh, Tyrion is not in it for justice. He told himself in his first chapter in this book that he was going to do justice. But there's nothing just about humiliating Lancel and Pycelle and Jedos Slint and supporting the corrupt, tyrannical, monstrous Lannister regime. This is about Tyrion's ego. It's about his pride. It's about all of his resentments that have built up over a lifetime of being humiliated and bullied and disrespected for being a dwarf. This is all of Tyrion's spite and vindictiveness against the world that he's inflicting upon everyone who is below him. Everyone who he can dominate, he does, just for the sake of his own petty ego and pride. Tyrion is not even good at it. <laughs> That's the tragedy of it. Like, it would be one thing if he was, like, Machiavellian and, like, powerful and he actually managed to, like, hold on to power, but all of Tyrion's, like, petty bullying and, and spiteful domineering of people comes back to bite him in the very next book when Pycelle and Boros Blont and Meryn Trant and Shay and all these people who he's manipulated and fucked with come right back up and punish him. Tyrion's role, Tyrion's persona as an imp, does not succeed in armoring him as he advised John. No, it leads to his destruction. If Tyrion operated less on his ego and was more practical, then maybe he'd fight against the real threats like Littlefinger and Varys and save himself from the downfall that is engineered for him at Joffrey's wedding. Like, Littlefinger hired the dwarfs, Oppo and Penny, to perform at the Joust, which sparks Tyrion and uh, Joffrey's dispute, which partly gets him condemned. Like, Oberyn Martell says, Hey, Tyrion... It's a good thing that you got yourself accused of murdering Joffrey, because otherwise I probably would have been accused, because I'm the Red Viper of Dawn, famous for poisoning people, right? But because of, like, Littlefinger's machinations, and because of Joffrey's short-sighted antagonization of Joffrey, like, Tyrion threatens to cut off Joffrey's cock, and Tyrion publicly threatens Joffrey because of his pride and his emotions. If Tyrion wasn't so driven by his pride and his humiliation and his emotions, then maybe he would be successful. But, no, he's not, and Tyrion ultimately fails, and that drives his transformation in the final, in book five, into a goddamn villain who wants nothing but to burn the world. Josh Joshery in the live chat says, I feel bad for Tyrion. I feel bad for Tyrion too. And the best villains are the ones we feel bad for. He he is sympathetic. I do feel sorry for him. He has had a hard time. But he's still one of the most fucking rich, privileged, powerful, cushy people in the goddamn world of Westeros. And he feels sorry for himself more than he should. Like, yes, he has absolutely been mistreated, and he absolutely has had a hard time in a lot of ways. Um, but I think the correct way to deal with being persecuted is not to persecute others for your own satisfaction. Uh, it's to try and step up and take a wider view and see how you can genuinely make things better. And the question is, will Tyrion ever get to that point? Because it seems as though, like, where he's where he's going, the direction he's going, like, like he's, he's joining up with Daenerys, and Daenerys is on a path of fire and blood. Like, in her last chapter in Dance, she rejects planting trees, she rejects Marine as her home, and she starts to 
uh, take the side of fire and blood and conquest and Tyrion's going to be right there with her because she wants to use her to get revenge and get blood uh, and so I think Tyrion is going to go in a really dark direction and the question is will he pull out of that nosedive and become a good person in the end. Uh, I think that Tyrion will... One of the problems with Game of Thrones Season 8 was that Daenerys burned King's Landing and it was never really properly explained or fully explored why Daenerys burned King's Landing. That was one of the big problems with Game of Thrones Season 8 and I think that Tyrion might be the missing link there. In the TV show, they whitewashed Tyrion. They made him a boring good guy. In the books, uh, I think Tyrion may be pushing Daenerys towards fire and blood and may... Uh, encourage her to burn King's Landing. Uh, Young Griff might be in King's Landing when they burn it, uh, and Tyrion's not a fan of Young Griff or of Griff. Um, And I think that maybe after Tyrion encourages Daenerys to burn King's Landing, he then, similar to the TV show, will go and find the corpses of his siblings Cersei and Jaime. Uh, And in the show, the drama of that scene was that Tyrion was sad that Cersei and Jaime died despite his best efforts to protect them. It was simply through Tyrion's incompetence and failure to understand or control Daenerys that led to their deaths. Uh, The much better, more interesting drama in the books, potentially, will be that Tyrion will find the corpses of Jaime and Cersei, and the reason they'll be dead won't won't be because of Tyrion's failure to protect them, it'll be because... Tyrion tried to have them killed, tried to get vengeance, he tried to harness fire and blood, and I think it will only be after Cersei and Jaime's deaths that Tyrion will realize, oh shit, what have I done? I think it will only be after Tyrion causes unimaginable destruction, revenge against Cersei and Jaime, revenge against the people of King's Landing who he he said he wanted to poison them all. I don't think Tyrion will protect them, I think Tyrion will cause them to be burned and killed, and then I think the regret and the horror will fall onto Tyrion. Because in the final episode of the Game of Thrones show, they made Tyrion Hand of the King, and they said, Tyrion, you're Hand of the King uh, so that you can make up for your mistakes. And in the TV show, that was not very emotionally weighty because Tyrion's mistakes in the last few seasons of Game of Thrones was just being generally incompetent and his plans failing and betting on the wrong horse because Daenerys turned out to be a a dragon Nazi horse, not a virtuous queen. Um, But in the books, it could be much more interesting because Tyrion's mistakes will be wanting bloody vengeance and murder against everyone who ever was against him. Um, I think his mistakes will be causing the death of his siblings and, and destroying everything when when he should have um chosen a better path so we're gonna wrap up the live stream now um but gosh darn Tyrion Lannister what a character someone should make a video about him um thank you so much for joining in this was episode 103 of the Game of Thrones Bridge podcast on Alt Swift X uh thanks for joining in go subscribe to the podcast on the podcast feed slap that like button subscribe and uh and yeah i think we're going to do a quick um old Drift x games uh after show uh we have a we have a side channel where i play video games sometimes we're going to play a little bit of the binding of isaac which is a uh, weird dark biblical themed uh video game uh, so you can go and check out there. We'll probably start a live stream there very shortly and, uh, and then we'll be done. So, uh, thanks for joining in and, uh, cheers. Stay shifty. Uh, sorry, real quick. So thanks for the super chat from Chin Okonokwo, who says, what's Littlefinger's problem with Tyrion? I don't I don't think Littlefinger has any particular beef with Tyrion specifically. He, he's just an opportunist. 
And when Catelyn Stark came to Littlefinger with that Valyrian steel knife and said, hey, like, someone tried to murder my son, Littlefinger saw an opportunity to pin it on a Lannister to spark a conflict between the Lannisters and the Starks in order to advance politically. And Tyrion is an easy person to pin things on because he's the ugly, hated imp dwarf, right? So... I don't think Tyrion. I don't think Littlefinger has anything against Tyrion specifically. He just used Tyrion uh, to spark conflict because it was convenient. Uh, that said, I, I think Littlefinger is a similar character to Tyrion in the sense that he feels like he has been treated unfairly and he wants to get revenge on people. And I think Littlefinger, as you know, a very sort of lowly uh, person in terms of status, he's not in a great house. He comes from just like a landed knight, the smallest of small lords. I think Littlefinger wants revenge against like the whole class of noble people in general, uh, and Little Fi- and 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 Tyrion as the son of Tywin Lannister sort of you know is a good target in that sense because he's about as upper class upper class as it gets. Um, also, thanks for the super chat from Fatty McCornbread, who says, uh, "What's your reading list in history and nonfiction?" Or a list of old-timey sex worker names you must choose. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, ooh, I ch- all right, I'll choose the reading list. Uh, I, I, uh, I've I been reading a book about octopuses. Uh, it's called The Soul of an Octopus uh, by Cy Montgomery. And uh, it's very cool. Um, and... I've also been trying in history. I- I've been trying to read uh, a short history of Byzantium because it just looks really dope. And maybe, uh, maybe that alt shift ZZZ person might do some readings there. That uh, might be cool if if alt shift ZZZ gets around with it. Uh, and thanks for the super chat from Rob Ford. All right, all done. Thank you, everyone. Uh, goodbye.